This is some uh, notes about lessons I learned in my latest hobby program in Grinds with Matplotlib and Funk Animation. These are Python libraries and a word or two about MCTS Monte Carlo Tree Search. I'm doing this for documentation reasons so I don't forget these things myself. As a reference point, I have about four months full time experience working with Matplotlib Funk Animation. This is totally on my free time, so I'm definitely not very good at it. But if you're a beginner and still listening to this, me having a lack of experience might actually be a good thing. Sometimes devs who have all the rookie mistakes fresh in their mind uh, might contribute a thing or two. Lesson learned number zero, keep things simple. This is mainly high level acclaim to map the funk animation in Python generally and how easy it is to use. When I first started, I used WinAPI with C++, some JavaScript, JavaFX, and PyQt5, and although they're more wide-spanning in what you can do with them, they're generally not as easy to use as Matplotlib Funk Animation Python if you're only going to make a relatively simple animation video. One example is if you have a website and you're thinking about embedding some animation in it. Think really hard about whether the user has to interact with it, with buttons and sliders, for example. Because if user interaction is not a necessity, you can avoid putting in JavaScript or one of its mutants into your website and instead just embed an MP4 video. In my opinion, that's easier and more maintainable. That having been said, Matplotlib Funk Animation and also Python have their limits. And lesson learned number one is that one should test how fast one's computer can render a Funk Animation so I can get a hint of the kind of performance one can get within reasonable time. So get a Funk Animation tutorial of choice and uh, scale it up and see how much it can do in a number of frames, both when you play it live and when you write it to file. Try different settings like blitting, see how, how it changes things. Try different types of axis objects. Use NumPy as much as is humanly possible. Lesson learned number two, MVC, Model Viewer Controller. For those of you who don't know what this is, read about it. It's a design pattern that is very important. MVC is one of those things that one can always improve. As a very simple example, everything up here is the model, and this can eventually be expanded into many, many different files, modules, and classes. And everything down here is the viewer, and it can be also be expanded into modules and classes. Put as much algorithm logic in model as possible, but be aware it is often impossible to do everything in model. Sometimes some things just have to be built dynamically and expensively in the viewer. Uh, we can also have a controller from which the model and viewer are launched. That could be a separate module or a main function here. It's usually a good idea to have it, but I often skip it because of laziness. MVC is pretty much only used to talk about web frameworks, but I think the principles are really good and apply much broader. Lesson learned number three, raster or vector. What do I mean by this? Raster means that the plotted objects are some kind of pixel fill or a scatter plot. The dots in the tree here are uh, such pixel fills or scatters. Whereas a vector means that the plotted object is defined as a line or polyline, like the lines here. It's good to experiment with both. One good thing about raster is that the whole plot can be stored in a single boolean numpy array. So each iteration is about figuring out which booleans are to be true in this NumPy array raster, and then I scatter those. This is essentially how both cartoons and TVs work. They just do this more extensively. And all of these NumPy array changes should be pre-computed in the model so that viewer can just query the result. Here's an example where the viewer loads a logger that the model has saved during its computation. Lesson learned number four, unified coordinate system. Don't use any transforms between different coordinate systems. The best way I've found of doing it so far is to base the coordinate system on this uh, same NumPy rows and columns system. So this logger, for example, from the model has recorded something that happened at Y coordinate or NumPy row 248, an X coordinate or uh, NumPy column 200 and based on this, the viewer can now draw something. So in this animation, for example, when I hover the mouse over the canvas, I can see the coordinates in the lower left corner, and they represent a row and column in a NumPy array with the same dimensions. 
and in uh, int uh, format, of course. Lesson learned number five, the animation loop. This loop needs to be as fast as possible. Instead of aiming for a single plot command at each iteration, LOTS is about how to aggregate many things that are plotted in chunks. There's more to it than just blitting. One needs to figure out how much work can and should be achieved in a single iteration. One way to do it is to use the outer loop to plot the contents of NumPy arrays. Some final expensive decor stuff like line drawings can be triggered by modular conditions. One of the big advantage of this type of nesting is that one gets good control over the animation frame rate and how fast it renders. So for example, the logger here is nested and I can set up the animation loop with modular conditions to either draw one of these at each iteration or uh, to draw one of these or maybe 10 of these at each uh, animation iteration. It was a big uh, revelation to me when I got this to work the first time because using this type of nesting I can get a rough coarse granularity idea of how the whole animation will look like while not having to wait for uh, very long to, to render. Lesson learned number six. Don't run the whole animation before having had a look at a picture of the final result. Another thing that really helps debugging is to have a switch, like here, between either running the animation or just showing a picture of a certain frame of the animation. In my case, the picture alternative of this switch only produces the final result numpy array, but it's also possible to make it show a frame of your choice. Even if it doesn't show exactly what the animation will look like, it's still very helpful. Lesson learned number seven, switching between complexity levels. This is about incremental improvement, being able to easily switch between different granularity levels for debugging. The idea in this program was that there are three levels of granularity for the animation. Here, this is the smallest level, and this means uh, the extent of the map. Here is the second, the medium level, and then here is the final. And switching between them can be achieved seamlessly by changing this value. And uh, this animation shows the smallest level. Here is, is the medium one. And then this is the final with the various settings. This is good to preemptively eliminate bugs. Start working on the smallest level and scale up incrementally. So a couple of words about the algorithm that is being animated. I don't share this code on Git because it's a hobby project and the code is a bit too cryptic for sharing. The outline of the model is here with the basic MCTS components. First, a set of parameters are instantiated. And in this case, there are about 25 parameters in total that affect how the animation will end up looking. A so-called env or, or environment is also instantiated. And here is where I put all the map information with dimensions, sun and water information, etc. And they're all stored in NumPy arrays. The model is then run with all this input and it builds two main things. The logger of key events that happen during the tree search and also the final tree as a dictionary and as this uh, raster NumPy array. And these are needed if one, for example, wants to plot the result as a picture. By the way, one could use a tree data structure instead of a dict here if memory or other things in a model becomes a bottleneck. But at least in my case, this was uh, definitely not uh, the or even a bottleneck. So basically, with these parameters, MCTS will try to build a tree. And what are these parameters? The number of iterations, branching factor. Here is uh, C, uh, the exploration exploitation trade off. Most of these parameters have nothing to do with MCTS and are just heuristics that make the MCTS search tree look more like a real tree. And uh, when this is done running, we get this score. And uh, the main success factor here was actually found to be the percentage of failed expansions over the energy maximization of sun water and the gravity balance, or, uh, et cetera. So what is meant by a failed expansion? Essentially, this is all a cost-minimizing uh, space-filling algorithm. And uh, in a cost-minimizing space-filling problem, you can get this kind of situation where branches are blocked by the ones higher up in the tree. It's a real problem in nature, 
uh, and in the end it's an empty hard problem at least if one scales it up sufficiently inevitably what ends up happening when you grow a large tree this way as a combinatorial optimization problem is that an increasing amount of selections lead to places where no expansion is possible one can of course try to minimize these failed expansions by various hacks such as the parameters I showed but it is empty hard in the end so one can only get so far you can also see some uh, pruning here so this node was stuck and was uh, removed this uh, node is also stuck so where, where is it supposed to expand to and how can the information about this node being stuck be propagated through the tree in any realistic and uh, efficient way so I ran into a bunch of these dead ends and uh, came up with some heuristics to resolve them uh, one cool thing I discovered midway into all this was that one can stitch multiple videos together so maybe it's already obvious but uh, uh, I never actually ran the tree above ground and below ground at the same time but instead uh, one at a time and then stitched them together using this uh, FMPEG uh, stitcher concerning time spent uh, at this stage by this time I, I thought that I was about 80% done but in fact it was 50% uh, until uh, my final result and I gave up I was uh, considering adding fractals in the canopy but I gave up instead here is an example of a very beautiful fractal tree video by syntax error 147 this whole canopy uses the same structure as here like branch here with this number of degrees duplicate and then run recursion on that in smaller scale there's no autonomous tree search here but it looks great so perhaps one could combine tree search with uh, fractals to create a nice looking animation one pretty uh, scary thing about the fractal video is that it uh, apparently took 80 hours to render but it's probably pretty easy to scale down <laughs>